Matt on CBC Radio 1. My name's Matt Galloway. One of the people raising the alarm about Huawei in this country is Margaret McQuaig Johnson. She's a senior fellow at the China Institute at the University of Alberta and has worked with the federal government for more than 35 years. She's also past president of the Canada-China Friendship Society. Margaret, good morning to you. Good morning. What do you make of what you've just heard from Ali Khan Velshi of Huawei Canada? Wow. <laughs> there are a lot of things that he's uh, saying, just kind of dismissing uh, concerns about secure, uh, security um, and China's intentions in um, getting Huawei throughout the world. Um, so I've, I've got a lot of concerns with what he said. One of the things he said is that Huawei is a private company, that it's not an arm of the Chinese government. There has been reporting and research that suggests uh, that that it may not be the case. What do you think? Well, it's 1% owned by Meng Wanzhou's father, Ren Junfei. And the other 99%, as you said, is owned by a trade union committee, which is managed by and accountable to Communist Party officials. And so like other trade, union, trade unions in China, it's state controlled. Um, they give some of their employees, those of, that have been there for more than three years, uh, an extra bonus payment. Um, and they try to look at that as if it's uh, profits on a share. But the employees can't monetize any ownership. Uh, they can't uh, sell share, sell their shares um, to others, mm. as you would in a normal uh, company. Why does this matter, the ownership piece? Well, it, the ownership doesn't matter so much as the control. And so if the, the control of trade union committees is by the party, then you look back to the connection between the party and the government, which is there's there's no difference, essentially. What about in this country? Is Huawei Canada a Canadian company in your eyes? Well, it's like uh, any international company that sets up a, a branch, and they've got specific things they've been doing in, in Canada, primarily R&D, as well as providing some th uh, 3G and 4G equipment. Uh, but the uh, home office in China is where the equipment is made and where the company gets its broad uh, uh, direction and priorities. I guess in, in part it matters because people are wondering who's going to be calling the shots if Huawei Canada is, is as deeply involved as it wants to be in helping to build the 5G network here. Right. And you mentioned the national intelligence law. Well, um, he said we've had th that for the whole 10 years that Huawei's been in, in Canada. Um, in fact, the the new national intelligence law came out in 2017, and as you said, it, it requires companies to spy if they're re requested to do so, and to keep it secret. And it also has a third section to, to that um, part of the legislation, that it protects the organization. The state will protect the organization mm. that's assisted with uh, the national intelligence work. So when Alakan Velshi says that the company wouldn't comply with that new national intelligence law, your reaction to that is what? It's They would have to, and uh, we would never know because they have to keep it secret. I have 37 years of reading and writing legislation in my work in government, mm. and it, the, the uh, section of the act is crystal clear and it's new. So there's obvious intent, and China could reassure us and reassure other countries that have the same concern by rescinding that section, but they haven't done so. And 52% of Huawei's business is in China, so of course they would do what they were told. And in fact, I'd also add, um, there was a study done in July of last year that identified more than 100 middle-level Huawei China staff with direct intelligence and military connections. And so what should, just briefly before we take a break, what should we make of that? Well, um, I think the intent is clear that in the long term, they want to use this uh, platform as a tool for uh, spying on other countries. Well, I, I think what we've seen, um, certainly in the last year, is that China has proven its malevolent actions against China, Canada. And um, so a Canadian decision can't just be taken based on technology uh, and how well it works, or on the reassur reassurances of Mr. Wren and Mr. Velshi. Uh, we wouldn't be discussing this at all if China were a transparent and collaborating country, but it's been proven to be anything but. So if you can imagine 
um, if they had access right now to our IT system and by connection to our electricity grid, those would be two very powerful tools to turn the screws on us, even more powerful than kidnapping our citizens and banning our products. And, and in fact, there there are other options. He talks about, um, you know, Canada can't wall itself off from, from China right. and the rest of the world. No, of course not. But we can choose to to have safe technology uh, in our critical infrastructure. And um, Nokia is made in Finland and Ericsson is made in Sweden. Although both of them do manufacturing in China as well. Yes, they do. But, but they're, they, you know, he talks about we wouldn't be able to um, have access to it once it's installed. It's installed. One of the things that we're concerned about is not just the back doors and, you know, they always have, the company always has to be able to do updates and fixes, uh, through back doors. So they, they would con- uh, continuously into the future be involved. Uh, but also there'd be the, the ability to put a bug into the system and cover it up. Uh, and have it released at a later date or or a complete shutdown of the system. So those are some of the concerns we've heard from uh, the uh, cyber people at Homeland Security. There are concerns about surveillance in in American tech companies. You think of Google, you think of Microsoft, you think of Facebook and the amount of data that they've hoovered up from all of us and who knows where that's gone. What is so different about what China's doing? The difference is the malicious intent and uh, and the the threats um you talked about uh, the chinese ambassador talking about re- repercussions if we don't accept huawei and um china's vice minister of foreign affairs lu uh, lu yu chang has uh threatened that if miss meng uh isn't released there will be grave consequences that the Ch- canadian side should be accountable for so this is a, a very different uh country than uh, an American-based country or European-based country. Um, and, the, you know, there's a sense uh, by some who look at this that the risk can be managed. So what risk would be we be comfortable accepting? Um, 1%, 5%, or some unknown amount? Personally, I don't want to have the possibility of security risk uh, in our critical IT. Huawei has been in, in this country for a long time, and, and there uh, are elements of its technology already in the wireless networks that we use. Alikan Velshi says there haven't been any complaints uh, about security or other matters in the time that uh, Huawei has been operating in this country. So shouldn't we take that uh, as some measure of, of reassurance? Well, two points on that. First of all, recall the security legislation says that they have to keep it secret. But secondly, they, their employees have been caught stealing other countries' IP and trade secrets and technology design in other countries. And um, I was listening the other day to an interview with the president of Huawei UK. And when he was asked about that, he said, well, that's what all sophisticated countries do. <laughs> and that's supposed to reassure us. Mm. Um, they just fired a, a recently a senior manager in Poland who was caught uh, stealing and uh, IP and um, and so the the response of the company is uh, to fire them and just to say oh that that was a rogue employee that wasn't the the real uh, Huawei decision from the Canadian government is expected at some point in time people believe this year uh, perhaps early on this year about what will happen with 5G and who will be awarded that contract what do you expect the Canadian government to do well, I very, very sincerely hope that they will decide uh, to exclude uh, Huawei from uh, competition. And um, they could do that either by a complete ban or do it by um, standards setting that Huawei can't meet. Mm. Um, uh, my fear in this, and I've been, as I said, in, in government for 37 years, my fear is often when things like these are issues like these are put to politicians, uh, to the cabinet. Uh, you have an option of let's go full bore in this direction, or don't don't do a thing. You know, uh, have it uh, completely stopped, or we recommend ministers this middle uh, position, and a middle position would be try to let Huawei in on part of the system. Uh, and uh, keep try to protect other parts of the system. And the problem is that uh, 5G doesn't work 
like that. Mm. That 4G and 3G do where you can protect the core. But, um, you know, 5G is um, a more sophisticated system where you have to be able to um, uh, move uh, sensitive storages at many different parts of the system. And you have to be able to make adjustments as necessary throughout the system to operate it at maximum efficiency. And so you can't have for uh, Huawei and 5G plus and other companies. And of course, it wouldn't work effectively. The context of this decision is that there are Canadians who are being held in China. Um, Many people believe because of the arrest of Huawei's CFO here in this country. That's right. And I've been collaborating with China for 40 years since my first visit in 1979. And I was in China when uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor were detained, Mm. and my own locked suitcases were searched. And so I decided when I got back, uh, I would speak out against the detentions. I think it's outrageous that a country that wants to be uh, a world leader, that wants to be a superpower, Mm. uh, engages in this kind of medieval behavior.